Well, good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the Sudden Arrhythmia Death Syndrome Foundation, the SADS Foundation, Facebook, YouTube, Twitter program, episode number 61. Can you believe it? It's great to have you. It's a last Friday, last day of April or happy May Day for our friends and families uh, down under. So wherever you are across the globe, great to have you with us. I'm Mike Ackerman, genetic cardiologist at the Mayo Clinic and director of Mayo Clinic's Winland Smith Rice Genetic Heart Rhythm Clinic and its Sudden Death Genomics Laboratory. It has been really wonderful to be together for this la these last now, wow, 14 months. And on behalf of our CEO of the SADS Foundation, Alice, Laura, and her entire staff. Yeah, so glad that you're here. Today's topic, I'm really looking forward to it. You know, last week we focused on CPVT. I hope you like that. We often focus on long QT, and we're going to focus today on one of the newer additions to uh, our program, the SADS Foundation. And that's for all of our patients, families, and friends uh, involved and affected with ARVC, arrhythmogenic right ventricular cardiomyopathy has gone by a lot of names and we'll touch on those names but today is ARVC day and and I can't wait to be joined by Brittany uh, Murray a genetic counselor at Johns Hopkins University and a very special person a patient and family to give their perspective Dina Edwards but first as you know we're still in the COVID-19 pandemic here in spring 2021 150 plus million cases worldwide, over 3 million deaths. And we've all been gripped this past week with some of the scenes from the spread of COVID-19 in India. And it's just been uh, heartbreaking to see our brothers and sisters in India going through what they have been. Here in the United States, we crossed 32.3 million cases uh, this week, 575,000 deaths. 32 million cases, but now over 250 million individuals in the United States vaccinated. That's great news. At a rate of about two and a half to three million individuals being vaccinated every day. And I was encouraged when I looked up on the Johns Hopkins University COVID uh, line, which a tremendous resource for all things COVID. And look at that curve. They were predicting the fourth surge, and it looks like that fourth surge is not happening. 58,000 cases yesterday, that's still a lot, but certainly down from our highest January 2nd, 2021, when we crossed 300,000 cases in one day. So everybody keep doing all the right things. Yep, no fear, just do it. What is that? 62% alcohol. So still wash your hands. That fevered business, taking your temperature morning and night. Damn, nope. Done with that. We stopped doing that at Mayo Clinic for both staff and all patients a long time ago. Wear your mask. I do inside yet. And oh, look at that. Baylor Bears, national champions, sick them. Yeah, I have my mask on, but guess what? I'm not wearing my mask in a car when I'm driving, and I'm not wearing my mask as a vaccinated person outdoors. So we need to kind of get a reasonable, and even the CDC finally came to that recommendation in the United States. Earlier this week, there's never been an outdoor mask mandate for my friends in the UK or in the Netherlands. I learned that. So there's a lot of things we have to figure out and do better. But Anyway, that's the COVID update. Stay safe, stay Corona free uh, for as long as you can. Get the vaccine when you can. The vaccine is absolutely QT safe. It's CPVT safe. It's Brugada safe. Maybe lower your temperature if you get a fever. Uh, it's ARVC safe. So speaking of ARVC, Aaron, work your magic and bring on Brittany Murray from Johns Hopkins University, ARVC Center of Excellence, uh, and bring on Dina Edwards. There you go. Welcome. 
Hi, Mike. Good to see you again. Hi, Dr. Ackerman. It's very nice to meet you, Dina, and to see you again, Brittany. And I'm looking, really looking forward to uh, our program. And before we talk about tomorrow's really special event, let's uh, get to know the two of you first. So, Brittany, let's start with you. I think we flipped a coin, uh, a coin, uh, and, and you you said you're first. So. Uh, tell everybody a little bit about your journey of how did you end up being a genetic counselor with a passion for patients and families with AR ARVC? Yeah, great. Um, so for those who may not know me, although um, Hugh Hawkins, my boss, the director of the Hopkins ARBC program will always remind people, I'm um, Midwestern Ohio born and bred, a huge Ohio State Buckeye fan. Um, however, I did my graduate training in genetics and genetic counseling at the University of Michigan, um, but I wore my Buckeye jersey proudly on campus. And um, then after that, after working a little bit, I um, got an opportunity to work in um, cardiovascular focused genetics, which is something that was a particular passion of mine um, and took the job at Hopkins um, over 11 years ago. So I've been there ever since. And this um, patient group and the team, anyone who's been with us um, knows that we're a very close knit team, um, the ARBC team at Hopkins. We work very closely together, and that's because we have the best patients in the world, as Dr. Hopkins always said. He, they are passionate and driven and um, just the nicest people, and they make it um, really easy to get up and come to work every day. That's great. Thanks, Brittany. And one of those people which you love working with uh, is with us. Dina. So Dina, do you want to uh, give a glimpse of your ARVC story for you and your family? How, when did it all begin? Sure. Um, so I actually started, uh, first of all, hello everyone and thank you to the SADS Foundation. Um, I've been to a, a number of your conferences that you've hosted, Dr. Ackerman, and just continuing to provide this outlet for patients and families is so critical to us staying connected. So big shout out to the SADS Foundation. Um, and also my continued love affair with the Johns Hopkins ARVC program. Uh, I really can't uh, herald it enough. It's been life-saving to both me and my family. Um, with that, I was actually officially diagnosed in October 2016 uh, following, uh, I was out running and I know that a lot of our ARVC friends are what I like to call former athletes uh, out for a run, uh, went into VTAC, uh, was able to get home, had an ambulance come to the house. Uh, I was at a heart rate of, um, oops, sorry about that, everybody. Might have popped off screen there for a second. Um, I was able to get home, uh, an ambulance was called and the ambulance actually noted that I was in polymorphic VTAC. So that really kicked off for me my journey of actually officially getting diagnosed even though I had had symptoms previous to that starting in my late 20s. Um, unfortunately, ARVC was not something that was really well known even at that point in the late 90s. Um, and I was a young healthy runner. So it was just sort of bypassed that I just had some sort of PVC manifestation. So I had an ablation in the late 90s, uh, was told to stop training so hard, uh, went forward and had two children. Um, and then in 2006, the bottom dropped out again during a run. Um, so I was originally down at uh, Georgetown University or George Washington University, I'm sorry. Um, and I was actually emailing, I commandeered a nurse's station, found Dr. Calkin's name, emailed him from the nurse's station and said, can you help me? They're calling this something ARVD at that point. Can you help me? And he said, I'll see you tomorrow. Um, so from there, I actually went up and went through the entire process of getting um, double confirmed diagnosis with the Hopkins team. Um, you know, like all of us, uh, reinventing ourselves from athletes or just our former life and what does it look like to live with a degenerative condition and how do we take care of ourselves? That's really what I've been doing as well as uh, working to figure out has this passed on to my children? So mm. uh, healthy, safe, COVID vaccinated, like you said, Dr. Ackerman and ready to go. That's great. Well, thanks for that snapshot for both of you of, of how we got from there to here now. And, and here is a pretty special place that we're at, as you mentioned, um, 
the relationship to the SADS Foundation, and thanks for that, Dina. The SADS Foundation has been devoted to families, as you all know, at risk of uh, sudden cardiac death from genetic heart diseases, especially long QT syndrome since it was birthed in 1992. And so next year is going to be a pretty uh, amazing year as we celebrate 30th uh, anniversary. And as about three years ago, uh, we reached out and you all, Brittany, reached out and said, these ARVC families really do not have a nonprofit advocacy organization, a non-academic uh, advocacy organization for them to call home. And we in our board at the SAD sort of took it and said, you know, we do share in common the potential risk of sudden cardiac death at young age. There's some similarities. There's obviously a lot of unique features to the ARVC heart versus the long QT heart. But we said, the door is open, welcome in. Uh, we'd love to have you as part of the SADS family. And, and I think I appreciate you, Brittany, all the work that you and Dr. Calkins did to uh, let the families know that there's a new, an, another home for them. And, uh, and that brings us to tomorrow. For, for 21 years, I think it must have started in the year 2000, the Johns Hopkins University has hosted the ARVC patient and family seminar. And now we're up to tomorrow, the 21st. Last year's got, as they say, Corona. And so it was canceled. And this is the 21st, but the first that is virtual tomorrow for anybody anywhere uh, in the world. And today, the rest of our time together is kind of a sneak preview for what ARVC families uh, and those interested in the ARVC can expect. So Brittany, let them in a, a sneak look uh, at what tomorrow is gonna be like. When does it start? What's gonna happen? Who's on the who's who list or for gonna be there? Yeah, we're really excited about it. So back in 2019, when we had our 20th anniversary of the program, um, of the ARVC program, we threw a big hurrah um, mm -hmm. and we paid for all of these international experts to fly into Baltimore from all over the country um, and had this big two-day-long um, two event on international, literally every single world expert on ARVC um, in person. And a lot of patients were, you know, oh, I wish that I could have been there. Or I wish I could have um, seen that, you know, that would have been so great. And now, you know, we really feel in the COVID era, the one of the only good things is this really virtual connection. And we're kind of doing the same thing again um, for the patients. Um, and we're really excited. It's uh, going to be a full day of international experts on ARVC. So you can always go back on our website and uh, listen to the Johns Hopkins team talk about our personal expertise. And we had a little mini um, session um, with SADS in the fall with just the Johns Hopkins experts. But tomorrow is really about inviting our international colleagues to share their expertise. So um, it's all recorded talks with some live Q&A in between. So it starts at 8.30 in the morning Eastern time um, for opening remarks by Hugh Hawkins. But you don't have to get up at 8.30 in the morning Eastern time if you don't want to. All of the talks are going to be recorded and available afterwards that you can watch at your leisure. Um, however, there will be three live sessions that are um, opportunities for question and answer with the experts and then also breakout sessions with um, your peers um, for live talking um, throughout the day. Um, that th Those are gonna be the only things that you might wanna earmark in your specific time zone um, that you may want to do. And that agenda is all available online. Thanks. But we're gonna have things from, you know, biochemical and pathology experts to psychology and mental experts all across the board. That's been an incredibly 570, you said, are registered already, but there's an important word there, registered. So they can't get in for tomorrow unless they register, and it's pretty easy to do that, right? Right, exactly. The SAS Foundation has been 
absolutely amazing with helping us advertise and messaging. So um, the, the link to register um, has been sent out in SADS bulletins on the SADS scrolling website. It is also on our website, ARVD.com under events. Um, the link to register, all you have to do is an email, name, things like that, and then you're registered and you can access the talks live tomorrow or at any time within about 90 days afterwards. And uh, so those who are joining on the side, I'm seeing some names, familiar ones popping up. And so it's great to have you. And if by chance you have ARVC or a question about ARVC and you can't wait until tomorrow, feel free to pop it in the chat line. I'll keep my eyes on over there and I'll present it to Dina and Brittany or, or myself and help you out a shout out and a congrats to Diana, our 10k marathon completed yesterday but she doesn't have arvc so Brittany doesn't have to palpitate she has a different heart condition but way to go first place uh that's fantastic dina you said you were diagnosed finally in october 2016 mm -hmm. after some 2006 yeah, actually 2006 mm -hmm. after some missed opportunities to to be detected. I'm gonna come back to that, but so sure. from 2006 to tomorrow, how many of these programs have you attended? So I actually attended my first um, ARVD family, patient family seminar in May of 2007. Mm -hmm. um, and during that time, I was able to actually go up on stage as a, as a brand, brand new, diagnosed patient to give my perspective of what the beginning of my journey looked like. Uh, and I will be very honest with you, I cried. It was it's so emotional for me. Um, when you get something as a, a diagnosis like this, you think you're gonna step outside of your house and you're gonna die. It's terrifying. Mm -hmm. Knowing that you have experts at places like Hopkins who are connected with experts all around the world and the amount of research that has happened just since I was diagnosed 15 years ago now is amazing. Being able to come to the seminar and connect with other patients and families who understand what it's like to have something that no one else has ever heard of, that the general population would look at you and say, but you don't look sick. Mm. How can you be sick? What's wrong with you? So there's this invisible component to ARV, ARVC when you're tired or you're having constant PVCs or you just had your new ICD placed that a lot of people don't really understand the, the emotional side of that and the mental side of that. So having places and people that you can connect with at the conference is absolutely critical and has actually been critical to my own journey in sort of defining what my life will look like moving forward. That's great. And what, uh, and how many have you been to, Dina? So I think over the years, I've probably been to 10. Wow. Um, I used to have an international job, so I traveled quite a bit. So there were a few that I missed. Um, I felt really fortunate once um, the Johns Hopkins team was able to put videos up that I was able to see those things post-conference to stay up to date on research that was happening around the world, um, whether it was with the fish, fish reach research that was going up up north, um, Dr. Seyfritz, I think, um, hearing from Dr. Lagersh in Australia about his MRIs that he was doing of patients' hearts while they were biking uh, in the MRI machine so he could see. Um, again, those things were really critical to me when I wasn't able to attend personally. Yeah, and Brittany, Courtney uh, has joined us from Ohio. So Courtney, great to have you back. And it's tomorrow is gonna be her third one with you all. She loves it and she's, particularly excited to hear from Dr. Sears. Uh, tell us a little bit about Dr. Sears and his topic. This is the whole area of, you know, how's your psyche doing? How's your psychology doing? How, uh, how are you, your mind, heart, soul doing with your ICD if you have one? What, what can people expect to learn from uh, Dr. Sears? And when he's on, tell him that I'd love to have him on our program uh, for one of our upcoming SADS Facebook Live programs. Yeah, Dr. Sears is a fan favorite. Um, he is, uh, we told him the last time that he came to Baltimore to speak at the seminar in person that he is the most frequent guest. 
Um, you know, we try to spread around. We have usually one guest speaker every year, um, but it's always that one guest speaker and Dr. Sears. For those of you who don't know, Dr. Sam Sears is a cardiac psychologist um, who works at East Carolina University, and he's devoted his life work really to studying ICD patients um, and the psychology um, um, and the psychological impact of ICDs, which is something that um, needs more research um, and more data and more recognition. Um, and his talk tomorrow about seeking your best self, it I've already watched it. It's fantastic. It's already a Sam Sears classic um, and is really going to talk about thriving with this condition um, and living your best life even um, though you have a, a diagnosis of a chronic condition like ARVC. So that would be, I would mark it on your agenda, one of your can't miss talks. That's great. I love that he used the word thriving. I didn't invent the word, but part of the SADS Foundation tagline for a long time now, ever since I became president of the board, is to live and thrive despite your diagnosis. Not just live, but thrive. And so I'm glad that he's going to be emphasizing thriving. He's a great person. Speaking of the ICD journey and story, for those out there, some of you might remember a conversation I had with a really special person with her debut book, Lightning Flowers from Kate Sandifer. Uh, Aaron and her team will probably post that book title. Uh, I'm into it. I've started reading it, Kate. If you're watching, you are amazing. Uh, and the book is a real, uh, uh, um, a real book as to the real feelings that real people are having when they have that machine in their body. And it's an amazing machine uh, uh, that is life-saving for those who need it, but it has a life of its own. And, and um, uh, Dr. Sears will speak to that. Dina, it sounds like you own one of these machines, so you can probably speak to it as well. Um, has it been, did it take a while for your heart, mind, and soul to get used to that thing in you? Absolutely. Um, thank you for the recommendation on the book. I'll have to write that down and, and read that. Um, as I sit here in front of you, I am actually just waiting for my alarm to go off. Um, I'm sitting at 2.61, waiting for my recommended replacement time alarm to go off. And I would tell you over the last year, that's been a lot of stress, <laughs> thinking that I was going to have to go in and get surgery during COVID. I know a lot of patients have had to do that anyway. And um, facilities have really just been wonderful. I've been able to kind of wait it out. Uh, so this is this will be my third device coming up that I'm getting ready to have. Um, in my first device was placed in 2006. In 2011, I had a fractured sprint fidelis lead. Um, so at that point, I had the ICD as well as a second lead inserted. And now I'm waiting to probably get that first lead extracted. Um, and go through that process again. So I've actually never been through a battery depletion. I've only ever been through sort of an emergency um, breakage. Um, I will tell you that yes, it took a while for me to get acclimated to having a device in my chest, first of all, just the feeling of it. Um, I tend to be very sensitive. So just any sort of movement for a while, it took a while. It took me some time to get used to having a device in my chest that was monitoring my heart. Um, now I call it CHIP 2.0. I keep hoping that Medtronic or someone is gonna put iTunes in it. Um, and now there's no way I would ever go without it. I'm very, I'm very, very used to it. So, but it doesn't mean that sitting on the verge of having another surgery isn't terrifying and actually brings up sort of what I'll call a lot of post-traumatic stress issues for me that I'm just trying to work through personally. Uh, because it's scary and it's a reminder that, oh, right, I actually have ARVC uh, because there are some days now that I just forget. Um, it doesn't take up every breath of every day for me every more because I am stable, uh, because I have keep up on my research. I make sure to stay connected with my doctors. I do my check-ins um, so that I'm prepared. If anything should happen, I'm ready to go to the next step. So that's one thing that I would always say that no matter what, stay in touch with your doctors, make sure that your monitors are connected uh, and ask lots of questions and keep really good notes. That's great. Thanks, Dina. 
Brittany, uh, uh, Dina mentioned worrying about having to go in during the COVID pandemic. And I'm curious uh, if your ARVC program at Johns Hopkins is, is anything like ours here at the Mayo Clinic, we've gotten a lot of calls this past year from our ARVC families about COVID-19. Uh, what, what kind of topics and calls have you had to feel the most uh, during this pandemic? Yes, we, it has been a very frequent um, topic of discussion over the last year. It's um, moved from in the beginning, you know, last spring, this time we didn't know a lot. So it was, am I at higher risk? Mm -hmm. uh, am I going to die if I get COVID? You know, what's going to go happen? You know, then we got a little bit more data. Okay, we think that our patients are not at the highest high, high risk, but definitely, of course, avoid it if you can. Then some of the data coming out about, um, you know, COVID long haul symptoms also causing myocarditis, which is an inflammation of your heart. And ARVC is already an inflammatory condition of the heart. So this double impact certainly would not be good. Um, and then this spring, it's uh, it really starting in January, it turned more to a uh, how soon can I get the vaccine? Am I um, high priority? You know, we wrote lots of letters um, verifying that our patients were high priority for the vaccine. Um, and so now it's about making sure all of our patients get vaccinated um, and are safe. All while the second big um, issue that I know you guys have probably seen in the Mayo Clinic, and we've seen a Hopkins of this delay of care. Um, you know, Dina, some patients, you know, really refused to come in for their follow up over the past year. And that's been a big crisis as well of that. We're seeing a lot of people who missed evaluations and so missed things and now trying to get these people back on track. And that's kind of the next hurdle that we're working on. You know, it's kind of amazing, isn't it? When we think about the SARS-CoV-2 virus and, and its potential to uh, infect or injure heart muscle cells that we all kind of thought that maybe that would be a nasty one-two punch for our ARVC families. And yet I think it points to uh, observations in the dish don't always translate to the whole host who tends to be unbelievably resilient if they're not obese, because we just have absolutely not seen a signal where the SARS virus has triggered an ARVC decline or a demise. Have you really seen that signal? We have not. Um, yeah. Other than we've had some patients um, who, I mean, luckily overall, our patients have been very careful and we have only heard from a couple handfuls of our patients who have tested positive. The main complaint has been increased PVCs. Um, so it's much more symptomatic. Um, but we haven't had any even patients who have had VTs. Right. Um, so it's really has not in the short term um, been any impact. And that's kind of been the good news, hasn't it? Because, you know, I've done the same. I've written the letters to say, you ARVC patient, you are a high priority if that helped them get to the front of the line. But I honestly don't even think their high priority or high risk because it just has not shown itself to bring out VT episodes, to bring out shocks, to bring out muscle disease decline. So it's been kind of a good news. Yep, we can use your disease as a way to get to the front of the line, but you don't have to worry about getting there fast because it just has not been a danger signal. And we've said that to all of our genetic heart disease families uh, basically with every genetic heart condition that your heart condition is not a high risk um, a situation for the virus. Stay corona free for as long as you can. Yes, let's still do that and get the vaccine uh, when you can. Tomorrow, what else is one of your favorite topics, Brittany, that, that you, you and your colleagues are going to cover? Yeah, so the other thing that we have um, coming at the closer to the end of the day, um, because our Australian friends are so nice to get up on their Sunday morning. Um, so <laughs> getting towards the end of the day, 4.30, 5 p.m. Eastern time, um, Dr. Andre Lagersh, 
um, who's also a fan favorite, has presented in person at our seminar before, is going to be talking about, uh, I think his title of his talk is The Rub of ARVC and Athletes. Um, and everyone's favorite question is about exercise and ARVC and what's okay and what isn't and was the data. And Dr. LaGrish has fascinating data. I um, mean, he's an exercise physiologist, so he oh. understands exercise impact on the heart. Um, and he has been uh, someone who's worked with our team, a great collaborator. And so his talk um, is another can't miss. And then we're going to join the live um, Q&A after that as well um, to take some questions live. We'll give Andre a, a shout out from me. He's not only a fan favorite, but Andre, if you're tuning in now, you know you're one of my favorites. So <laughs> his work is incredible. And I think it'll be interesting to see what we learn over the years for ARVC families. Whereas, you know, Dina, the word on the street is pretty much we better shut your engine down completely. Mm -hmm. Now that word used to be the exact same pronouncement that we would give every long QT patient, every, every CPVT patient, every hypertrope. And yet over the last 20 years, it's a completely different, uh, it's not even a new verse, it's a new book altogether. And we have an exciting paper coming out in Journal of American College of Cardiology with our experience with athletes all over the country with all kinds of genetic heart diseases, mostly long QT syndrome. So I do think the next chapter is, can't we give ARVC families and patients something that we can have them do? Do we have to keep saying that the safe dose of exercise is called no exercise? And, and what do you hope happens in that area, Dina? And what do you potentially see happening, uh, Brittany, in that area? Because that's, from my observation, that's the questions number one, two, three, four, <laughs> five from yeah. every one of my patients. Um, what 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 are you looking for in, in that in the future, Dina? Sure, and I will tell you, I've been really fortunate. Uh, one thing I do want to mention for everyone who's able to join tomorrow is if you're home and you want to connect with other ARVC patients, please reach out. Um, I'm always happy to talk to those who are newly diagnosed or struggling. Um, it can be just a really hard time to go through and to sort of lose that sense of self. I will say that, um, and, and Brittany always laughs, but I ask a lot of questions and I push and I push. And I think the, the exercise conversation, we've seen what the research has shown, um, but we also know that people are individuals and depending what their genetic makeup is, it can actually impact how quickly they could, um, their, the, the degeneration could happen to their heart. And so listening to the science is really important. However, finding a balance for one's personal self is, is also really important. So Dr. Calkins and Brittany and Crystal and Cindy, I have talked to them extensively about things that I do and I'm very honest. Um, there are some things that, you know, I lift weights. Is that okay? How much should I lift? Um, so again, some of that is very personal and very personal to one's own sort of genetic makeup or what that looks like. My hope is that there can be some sort of balance. I think Dr. Ackerman, the question that everyone asks is, what's the safe heart rate I can get my heart rate up to? And I just don't think that's something that we're gonna necessarily be able to answer or give a one size fits all answer to anyone with ARVC because it is just, different. And if you are in a hot phase, you have to back off. If you are having multiple PVCs that are being measured, your heart is changing. You have to back off. So ARVC is the long game, I call it, um, and really sort of helping to redefine one's own experience of what does fitness actually look like, I think is really, really important. Great. Thanks, Dina. Brittany, um, what what say you uh, is that i mean i'm sure there's gonna be a lot of questions tomorrow on that topic yes yeah, so this is probably what i spend a lot of my time talking about sometimes i joke that i'm like a personal trainer um <laughs> because i spend so much time talking about exercise but i think that really speaks to how dr Coffins and i really approach this is that it's very 
personalized and we can work with you. Um, if you read the literature, you know, there's so many potential exercises out there that we can never just make a list of like, these things are okay. Um, and everyone is at different disease severities, different hotspots, as Dina mentioned. Um, and so uh, it's sometimes I like to say is that it's not exercise restriction, it's exercise modification. Um, we need to talk about exercising and being active differently than you are used to. And it's going to be a new normal, um, but we can work together to try to figure out what is a safe level for you while still trying to balance your high quality of life. And so that's really my big message to patients is that, uh, you know, to really try not to craft it as this is restrictive, but, you know, it's just going to be different. And we still want to work together to figure out safe ways that you can be active because there are, and Dr. LaGersh will present some of the data, um, a lot of exercises like weightlifting, which don't affect the heart um, the same way as endurance training does. Um, and so there are different types of activities that you can modify together um, to, you know, still get you that enjoyment and um, high quality of life. And Dr. Ackerman, I wanted to say one thing. One of the things for me that was a struggle was going from thinking I was an athlete, I was a college runner, I ran races after college. Um, that was part of my entire community. And when I was diagnosed with ARVC, one of the things I had to reframe for myself is I am still an athlete in my head. I love discipline, I love planning. So being able to take that mindset and turn it into sort of thinking about how I think about and plan my life, that was part of training anyway. So wow. for me, it was a big shift, not just physically, but mentally to say, I still define myself as an athlete. That's great. And it sounds like from Brittany and from Dr. Lagers, you now can become a bodybuilder. So <laughs> sure, bring it on. There you go. And you can apply the athlete <laughs> mindset to wait mm -hmm. that mean. Uh, we're rounding out uh, coming upon the top and and this has been great. I think we could go for hours and I just know Lori, I'm so glad your college son uh, didn't have his COVID aggravate uh, his ARVC. I wouldn't have expected it to. So thanks for validating what we just said and Nadia um, with your schedule for your ICD. We're all going to be thinking about you and Dina can has uh, already said, would love for you to connect if you needed to, to have somebody just be that um, fellow who's already walked in your shoes uh, now 15 years ago, sort of been there, done that, and would help, would love to help your anxiety level uh, decrease. Nadia mentions about her young children being screened regularly, and let's finish with that topic. Dina, you had mentioned, you know, once it was found in you, wanting to know and, and determine the status of, of your children. And there's been a lot of debate, and I bet you this will be a topic tomorrow as well, as when do you screen uh, children? And, and um, I have a particular feeling and view, but what's been that like trying to figure out the status of the kids? Sure, um, so I think the, the first thing that I did um, was uh, I got genetic testing as soon as I possibly could. Um, we know that there are genes that, that you can test for clinically, and there are obviously a number in research as well. Uh, for me, unfortunately, I come back as sort of genetic, what would the term be? Gene elusive. <laughs> Gene elusive. Um, so I don't test for one of those um, that is known. Uh, that does not mean that I do not have ARVC. I have ARVC. If you look at my MRI, if you look at all my testing, there is no question. I have an ICD to make sure that I am safe. Um, I think one of the interesting things about me is I'm actually not on any meds, but that's just my case. Uh, I actually started taking my children to Hopkins, uh, to the pediatric program um, under Dr. Jane Crossan, and now it's Dr. Della Ouz, uh, when they were five and six years old. Um, so they had been screened pretty much every year. They haven't been screened in the last two years. That's been nothing that's popped up. Um, I've also given skin to research through Hopkins. I've given blood to a research study that was being done at 
Baylor um, and got my parents and uh, two of my three siblings also to donate blood to see what else could be found. Uh, Cause I think that helping the researchers is critically important as a patient. Uh, so at this point I monitor my boys. I have two boys, they are now 20 and 16. Um, nothing has shown up in them. I feel very fortunate. So now I'm probably on uh, screening them every three years, but initially I screened them very early. I wanted to make sure that Hopkins had as much data on little kids as they could possibly have. Well, I've only been with you for 35 minutes, Dina, but you're amazing. So I appreciate you. I appreciate you sharing your journey. Thank uh, you. Thank you for having uh, me. And Brittany, I'm going to give you the final word of reminders for what's going down tomorrow for the 21st annual Johns Hopkins uh, ARVC Patient and Family Seminar. Yes, thank you. And thank you so much, Dina, for sharing your experience. Um, uh, so tomorrow, um, May 1st, uh, is the uh, event. The most important thing is to go to airbd.com or on the SADS website, sads.org, or over here in the chat, um, Aaron has posted the link and register ahead of time so you have access to all the talks. The agenda is the first thing that will pop up when you get there. Um, but if everyone really wants to kind of pencil in the first live event is around noon is the first um, uh, noon Eastern time is the first live question and answer session. So there's three live events throughout the day that are marked on the agenda. But otherwise, you can watch the talks at your leisure anytime afterwards. And of course, the Hopkins team is always happy to connect with you any questions later, but there's plenty of opportunity to connect with each other within the program platform. And I would really encourage that because that's one of the best um, things about this event every year is the community. Well, thanks a lot, Brittany. Thank you for all that you do. And uh, Dina, thank you for joining us. And for all of you out there in SADS Facebook Live land, this ends episode number 61. Stay strong out there. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything. Remember that faith over fear and join us next week. Don't miss our first Friday in May. That is the Friday before a really special day, maybe one of the most important days in the year called Mother's Day. And so we're going to have a special program with some mothers uh, to celebrate Mother's Day, to also see what is it like, as you've already gleaned from Dina, being a mom, watching over your children and, and being concerned about them. So next Friday, join us for a Mother's Day uh, celebration. And until then, uh, take care, everyone, and we'll see you next Friday.